Okay, now perfect, yeah. Well, uh, go back to the first slide. I think when we uh, uh, set up uh, the themes for talks in uh, this conference, me and Dr. Uh, Dr. Tarek, uh, we felt, well, obviously you can't have the a neurodisability conference without talking about cerebral palsy, and you can't talk about cerebral palsy without uh, talking uh, diagnosis uh, cerebral palsy, and, uh, and the early diagnosis is the most important, as still a problem we see uh, in our region and even in other uh, Western countries as well. Because as is of today, uh, uh, still children in high resource countries diagnosed around two years of age, which is not good enough by the current standard, and in the other low resource countries uh, as late as five or seven years of age. So it is vital to cover this topic in a conference, sharing our experience uh, and uh, giving you any kind of uh, uh, idea how to improve uh, detection of uh, uh, children with cerebral palsy as early as possible. There is only 20% of children uh, uh, or babies diagnosed with cerebral palsy uh, at six months of age. And since the introduction of the international guideline in 2017, it is feasible now to easily diagnose children with the cerebral palsy at six months of age or even at three months of age. Uh, those who are trained like us, me and Dr. Tarek in the 90s and uh, 80s, the traditional uh, talk is right, don't label anyone in cerebral palsy in the first uh, two years and call it evolving cerebral palsy or evolving motor, evolving motor disorder rather than cerebral palsy uh, and being shying away to label anyone cerebral palsy even when we are confident enough that uh, it is cerebral palsy. Without um, further notice, I think we just need to... Uh, I don't know how to Sorry, I'm just trying to move the slides. And I'll just go back to it. Well, I have uh, conflict and I have no, uh, nothing to declare uh, in terms of conflict of interest. So what we expect to cover over the next 20 minutes or so is try to answer those questions. Why matter early diagnosis of cerebral palsy? What are the barrier and challenges uh, for making the diagnosis? How to make early diagnosis? What is the tool we have in our hand to help us to make early diagnosis in a brief? And when important, when not to jump to diagnose cerebral palsy? And how we can improve detection of cerebral palsy? Uh, just to recap on the, the, the definition and the current epidemiology of the cerebral palsy before we proceed, obviously this, this, this definition uh, from the consensus group in 2007 still stand as uh, uh, the, the, the definition we use till today. Even there is some reservation about it's time to reshape some of the component of this uh, uh, definition as we will discuss it uh, later. It's a group of permanent disorder of the development of movement and posture causing by activity limitation that are attributed to non-progressive disturbance that occurring in the evolving fetal brain, also associated with other comorbidities and disturbance and sensation, uh, perception, cognition, and others. When we look at the current epidemiology of the cerebral palsy, over the past decade or more, we uh, still see stable incidence of cerebral palsy. But what we have noticed uh, that the lower level of cerebral palsy is uh, static, but which is level four and five, but the higher level, higher functioning level of the cerebral palsy is slightly on the rise. Uh, I think this is to do with the improvements of the uh, neonatal care and use of neuroprotective agents, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Um, we know that the uh, majority of the cerebral palsy uh, causes a prenatal, uh, with only 15% is postnatal. When Osler uh, described cerebral palsy in the 80s, in, in 1800, uh, uh, he described it first that the primary cause is birth asphyxia. But we know now that uh, is really birth asphyxia, although it's still important cause for the cerebral palsy, but constitute as only for about uh, 15 to lower 20% of the cause of cerebral palsy. Uh, 
uh, using the uh, theorem of cerebral palsy spectrum disorder, I think you will see more and more of this term in the near future because uh, 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 people felt it's really uh, the, the uh, best fit for the description of the wide variety of cerebral palsy and it's more beneficial to use it uh, maybe in the future as well. Uh, early detection of cerebral palsy, we've been through a journey from uh, since Little described the cerebral palsy in 1880 when he promoted early diagnosis of cerebral palsy uh, to McMana Mac Mac McNamara in, in 1950s or 1949, where he uh, also promoted uh, that we should detect cerebral palsy, make every effort in the first few months of life. Then there is a silent period until 19. Uh, uh, 70s or 80s, and the, uh, I think uh, the, the significant breakthrough comes in helping us in diagnosing uh, cerebral palsy early in the uh, late, uh, late 90s uh, with the launch of the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination and uh, the pioneering of the general movement assessment by uh, uh, Professor Heinz uh, uh, Pretzel. Uh, also, the advance in the technology in uh, uh, brain imaging, as well as uh, the emergence of the classification of cerebral palsy function system. Uh, another uh, important uh, landmark uh, we reached in 2017 by publication of the International Guideline of Cerebral Palsy, who have an instant impact uh, uh, in, in diagnosing cerebral palsy as uh, this group in Australia when they started the early diagnostic initiative and they put a target that they would like to using implementation of the guidelines to, uh, uh, in 2017, and they are able to achieve well beyond their target, reducing the, uh, reducing the, uh, the, the, the age of the diagnosis from really 22 months uh, down to under 10 months of age. It's only during the COVID, they have a little bit of setback, uh, and now they are back on uh, track again and aiming now to reduce it uh, up to age of uh, 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 three months. Why are we doing it? Why early detection of cerebral palsy matters? Obviously, we would like to produce a generation of uh, baby and children who are happy growing to achieve their uh, maximum potential. We have uh, plenty of evidence or strong body of evidence that uh, early intervention have a greater impact uh, and uh, uh, those children not to miss the opportunity of the rapid brain growth in the first year of life or the first 18 months of life, which is the most important part of the child uh, developments uh, in his life, an assembling team to support that child as early as possible, even from the neonatal uh, uh, unit to give him the stimulation, the support, the intervention will achieve better outcome. Uh, we know that the human brain go through a rapid fast of myelination and synaptogenesis in the first uh, year uh, or so maximum. And in the first three years in particular, that synaptogenesis continue throughout our adult life, but the maximum period in the first few years. And that's why early experience uh, in a stimulation, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic factors, practicing, all matters in the early life to produce uh, synaptogenesis and uh, better outcome. Uh, we know also from the data uh, available that children with cerebral palsy achieve 90% of their motor function by five years of age, regardless of their level of uh, uh, functioning, they will achieve their maximum uh, motor function by five years of age. We must remind ourselves as well that cerebral palsy is a childhood disability, but they persist into adult life. So it makes sense that any gain we do through early intervention in childhood will last throughout the uh, childhood uh, or adulthood. Another important factor why we do early intervention uh, important is the early detection should really help parents to cope better and be prepared uh, 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 to, do, to, to support their children to develop their, to their maximum uh, potential. Early uh, diagnosis also uh, will help in timely 
uh, psychological support for parents because you want the parent to be in a best mental status to deliver uh, the, 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 the uh, early intervention uh, and, and support and stimulation to their uh, children. This is an account uh, how it looks like when we break a news for a, 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 a child having a, a, a cerebral palsy uh, and how the parent uh, will perceive it. And of course, when our, with our busy practices, sometimes really we miss this opportunity to have a proper breaking news session. Uh, and, and breaking news session is a great opportunity for us to develop a long lasting therapeutic relationship with the family. And if you get it wrong from the start, then really you lose the trust of the family and the parent and parent will be frustrated, uh, having have a, uh, anxiety, depression, all sorts of problem. And that will have a negative impact on the child and the eventual outcome. This study just uh, uh, shows that uh, there is a really uh, uh, largely unsatisfaction from the parent uh, about how we deliver the news to them and how we conducted the uh, overall with less than 50% satisfied from the physician and how they give them the information and the, the prognostic information, the diagnosis, uh, etc. Another and last important uh, uh, factors in getting uh, important to get the early diagnosis uh, is really uh, that uh, investment on those early child development is a smart investment from the economical point uh, of view with the excellent uh, literan later on, on the society, on the family, on the child himself. This is a famous curve developed by James Hickman, who is a winner of a Nobel Prize. He's an economist, where he stated that prenatal program, program targeting toward earlier years, uh, uh, preschool uh, program and schooling will eventually lead to excellent uh, return. This is an eye-opening for many government who actually invest more in later uh, uh, programs uh, and adult program with a little return at the end. He developed what uh, he called the Hickman equation, which is invest, develop, and sustain. It will lead to gain. What are the challenges at the barrier making early diagnosis, knowing that if you get it wrong or miss the diagnosis, it will have a huge implication on family and the, the children. Well, uh, the, 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 the cerebral palsy by its nature have a, a definite biomarker when in a traditional way you can make a diagnosis. It's also, there is a lot of false positive and negative results in, 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 in assessing those children. Reliability of imaging in the first year of life is very difficult and also the classification in the first two years, it can be difficult and it can really uh, hinder the ability to make uh, uh, early diagnosis. Why is that? Because we still tied up with the current definition we use, uh, where it say that one of the criteria of the diagnosis of cerebral palsy to have an abnormal imaging. And also for many years, the recommendation to couple the classification with the diagnosis. They said classification of cerebral palsy is part of the diagnosis. It's only recently the recommendation and through the, uh, the new international guidelines, uh, there is more guidance toward early classification of cerebral palsy. And also we don't hold ourselves uh, of uh, diagnosing cerebral palsy early, waiting for a classification that should not happen. Also the desire to rule out differential diagnosis of every treatable condition first. And I think clinician is right. Sometimes they come across a cases and condition exactly similar to the cerebral palsy and presented the, uh, similar to the cerebral palsy, like hereditary spastic diaplegia. And they need to rule out that kind of diagnosis before confirming cerebral palsy. Lack of knowledge about the mainstream uh, pediatrician and those involving with the uh, uh, children with the uh, cerebral uh, uh, palsy. And I think uh, this is one of the reasons, a lack of training and competencies as uh, well. Uh, lack of uh, knowledge about child development uh, overall um, uh, also is a problem. Children who initially appear asymptomatic and the clinically, clinical sign appear later. Other reason, as we said, the, the definition itself 
have some limitation in making early diagnosis and maybe time to reshape that some of component of that uh, uh, definition. Uh, immature brain and developing brain continuously changing and remodeling in the first uh, uh, few months and first uh, years. Uh, developmental uh, or motor delay, some children present with motor delay, but later they, they catch up, the later bloomers also can create confusion. Difficult to address parent fears and concern uh, in, a man, in, a, in a satisfactory manner like we uh, demonstrated in the previous slides. Parent always insisting on uh, having a definite answer, which is sometimes difficult for us to give that definite answer. Also, some of us reserve to share concern with the parent uh, uh, with the fear that uh, of uh, the going away and disappear, uh, fearing of uh, stigma or grieving about the bad, the bad concern we are uh, sharing with them. Uh, the challenge of the neurological examination is very in a very tiny infant and how sometimes it cannot be reliable enough and depend on a, a mental and alert status of the uh, babies uh, as well and difficulty in conducting it in certain setting. Cerebral palsy can be confused with different clinical conditions such as musculoskeletal anomalies, genetic and other complex uh, disorder. How about to, to go the uh, make early diagnosis of cerebral palsy? Well, the triad of uh, uh, abnormal uh, imaging, uh, abnormal neurological examination, history of risk uh, factors, and abnormal standardized motor assessment is the traditional way of making the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And the remain history and clinical assessment is the most important uh, one. Well, when to suspect? Well, usually the first uh, sometimes uh, parent concern where they come up with a question, is there something wrong with my uh, child? And unless you have the knowledge or the basic knowledge of uh, uh, normal child development, you cannot uh, address the parent concern and to see the child deviate from uh, the norm to the abnorm. And uh, the, uh, the competency or the knowledge of the basic child development uh, should be uh, for everyone, every pediatrician, every allied health coming across uh, children and babies uh, should have the basic knowledge of the uh, child uh, development. Uh, in Royal see. College recently, we introduced uh, uh, the, uh, the child development as an important part of uh, 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 Royal College examination, which has been, but usually before it was as a small component but now, because of the importance of the child development, uh, the highest mark in the Royal College exam is about uh, uh, the child development uh, station. And we have seen significant improvements in the knowledge of the trainee on a child development, where before the main failure is actually is in a child development where they don't do well in the uh, child development station. Early marking, uh, I'm sure many of you uh, aware of that, uh, uh, the red flag, what we call it, uh, uh, involving uh, muscle tone, abnormal posturing, head lag, uh, failure to achieve their milestones in terms of the mobility, sitting, uh, standing, walking, uh, uh, abnormal movements, uh, feeding and swallowing difficulties, sleep problem, visual hearing problem, uh, and, and behavioral problem at a later age. Well, the, the uh, 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 presentation could be very, very subtle, such as in this uh, child or this baby who may demonstrate just this movement as an early sign of cerebral palsy. And I'm sure some of you recognize it. Uh, it's a normal in, in Nene to have such a movement. It's called infantile swallowing. But uh, if it persists, it's a sign of some neurological uh, problems. Also, when it starts, uh, uh, moving on the floor, babies uh, could show asymmetric uh, movements in crawling uh, that indicate uh, weakness of one side. What uh, tool we have, uh, uh, screening tool we have uh, in, in our uh, uh, hand to early predict cerebral palsy from neonate uh, onward. Uh, the Hammersmith neurological examination, general movement examination, cranial ultrasound, and magnetic uh, resonance imaging, uh, very useful uh, tool and the main tool we use. Uh, 
This is algorithm uh, for early diagnosis uh, uh, adopted from the, uh, uh, the international guidelines. Just show you that there is two uh, port or gate of referral to, uh, uh, to the screening uh, surveillance uh, uh, program, either from the neonatal detectable risk factor or children who have no risk factor, but later on discovered by general pediatrician or any other clinic uh, that uh, there is some concern about their uh, development or query cerebral palsy, then they refer if they are under five, they go through the traditional general motor assessment and uh, uh, Hammersmith assessment and the neuroimaging, that's the main, and after five months, primarily Hammersmith uh, until 24 months of age. The main scoring system uh, we're gonna focus, there is many of them, but we just briefly mention about the uh, general movement assessment uh, and uh, Hammersmith. General movement assessment uh, is really as most frequently it's you, sorry. Uh, general movement assessment uh, pioneered by Professor Hines uh, starting uh, uh, in, in 90s, and it led to break it through uh, in diagnosing uh, children with the cerebral palsy, even in the low income countries. It is very simple to conduct, uh, just need video camera, monitoring the child movement or baby movement while lying down, then with expert eyes, uh, trained eyes uh, specifically to assess the general movements of babies, uh, you are able to uh, to distinguish between normal general movement and abnormal general movements. Uh, it's appear usually by four, four months post-term, beginning in the uh, majority of children around six weeks post-term. Uh, it's uh, really in, involve uh, spontaneous movements, uh, uh, which is uh, um, uh, 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 variable in speed and amplitude uh, and lacking the stick, distinctive uh, sing, uh, sequencing uh, 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 movements. There is a time scale for it. Uh, fetal, start from the fetal uh, movements, general movements, writing movement, then followed by fidgety movement until uh, you uh, reach to a type of movements, uh, which is goal directed type of uh, movements. And as the table demonstrate uh, down, the average range of uh, emerging of each of these uh, movements. Let's quickly show you these two videos, demonstrating uh, the movements, which is uh, involving the whole uh, body, arm, legs, trunks, and head, with the various speeds and sequencing. Sorry. And as I said, it's very uh, difficult sometimes to distinguish between the two unless you are trained uh, uh, and certified uh, to do so. Similar uh, uh, things as well for this fidgety type of movement, which is an important part of the uh, general movement uh, assessment, differentiating between normal and abnormal uh, movement. The team will sit down really to look at the complexity, the variation and the fluency after video recording. And uh, you have uh, three options, either you say normal movements or suboptimal, abnormal movements or definitely abnormal movements. And the most important is to recognize that, that uh, abnormal movement, uh, which is lead to outcome or diagnosis of cerebral palsy. This is just to demonstrate to you that the most important is absent movements or abnormal movements and led to outcome of cerebral palsy. Technology is very advancing fast and shortly we will uh, be uh, seeing this kind of automated, uh, automated or automatic cerebral palsy diagnosis using artificial intelligence feeding uh, the machine uh, with the software uh, fed with the data of abnormal movements and normal movements, and that will help really to have a mass screening of uh, the uh, babies, uh, whether they are risk of cerebral palsy or have no clear risk of cerebral palsy. Uh, 
because at the moment, it's very difficult to have a universal screening for all babies to detect early cerebral palsy because of you need a lot of manpower and resources. Hopefully with the use of artificial intelligence and the development of uh, this software, which is underway, underway uh, maybe we'll see it in the next uh, few years to be implemented, uh, will help uh, really do mass screening or surveillance of uh, uh, babies uh, who may have cerebral palsy. Hammersmith neurological examination, again, it is um, a simple scorable standardized clinical neurological examination of infant between, as we said, two and 24 months. Uh, there is uh, about 26 items assessed the acranial nerve, posture, tone, quality, and quantity of the uh, uh, movements, reflexes, and reaction. As the colorful uh, kind of tra traffic light type of uh, diagram shows, uh, below 40, this is kind of uh, the most severe form of cerebral palsy, unlikely to achieve uh, uh, mobility, quadriplegic type of cerebral palsy. Score between 40 and 60, they are able to sit unsupported and they may have some kind of aid mobility. Uh, and above 60, usually they will achieve their mobility. Maybe some of them, they will be having kind of unilateral cerebral palsy, such as uh, hemiplegia but all will be mobile. Above 78 will be normal. Systemic review of tests to predict cerebral palsy in young children clearly demonstrate that general movement is the best diagnostic predictor based on meta-analysis, followed by the neurological examination and the MRI. What is the role of neuroimaging and cerebral palsy? Well, is to uh, identify the structural abnormality and also help us in uh, defining the etiology and give some prognostic statement regarding the cerebral palsy. For example, whether they're likely to have seizure or not based on the localization of the lesion and, and, uh, and learning difficulties and visual problems and so on. Combination of the uh, serial uh, cranial ultrasound MRI at term age uh, uh, equivalent is best predictive of motor uh, outcome. Cranial ultrasound have a still important role in a certain situation, especially in the premature neonate and intensive care uh, baby unit, when we have this little window frontanel to be able to directly visualize the, uh, the, the brain uh, and see if there is any soft tissue uh, changes. When there is a severe abnormality detected, such as in the uh, photos attached, uh, like BVL, ventricular dilatation, intracranial hemorrhage, we, we are able to uh, uh, say with confidence that uh, children will have a problems, a neurological problem as an outcome. But when there is a minor abnormality, then it is less uh, uh, predictive. Now you are saying that uh, there's still uh, a significant number of children uh, cerebral uh, palsy have normal uh, imaging, in particular a toxic group uh, uh, and, and some others. Uh, but I say here, but it's important to know who reporting this uh, 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 imaging because it makes a difference that uh, uh, the expertise who reporting the uh, imaging is very, very important before you take it for granted as a normal image. This study uh, exactly labeled uh, who report matters, looked at 111 children, uh, UK study, 111 children with a clinical diagnosis of cerebral palsy MRI scan uh, by local uh, comparing to a specialist uh, team in the regional hospital. And they found that they only agreed on the 34 out of 111 uh, 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 MRI with 60% of the normal scan not normal in terms of uh, quality or quantity. Sometimes they do recognize the abnormality, but the description of the abnormality is, for example, they may say unilateral and the changes in the specialist hospital, you say bilateral. Sometimes uh, the cortical dysplasia uh, diagnosed uh, as, uh, uh, as, as an infarction uh, in, in the local uh, team, but by the specialist team as uh, cortical dysplasia and so on. Well, uh, cerebral palsy is not always uh, what it seems. Um, uh, 
maybe I'll test your knowledge, uh, spot the difference here about those uh, picture. This is the reality when you come across the cerebral palsy. You cannot sometimes distinguish between which one is a duck, which one is different uh, species. Only if you hear the noise or this, the sound of that uh, each uh, bird, you may be able to recognize. And I think it's true for the cerebral palsy. They have a lot of similarity with other conditions. I know that uh, Dr. Khaled, inshallah, tomorrow will present you with the, uh, the mimics of cerebral palsy, but you cannot finish talk with the early diagnosed cerebral palsy without touching a little bit on, uh, on, on that, but it's not going to be in anywhere near details because I know that it will be covered uh, in a comprehensive way uh, in tomorrow, inshallah, conference. So what you look at, absence of known risk factor, family history of a progressive neurological disorder, loss of already uh, uh, attained skill, uh, developmental uh, regression, developmental of unexpected uh, focal neurological sign, uh, persistent hypotonia, uh, uh, persistent uh, or dominant ataxia, uh, fluctuation of symptoms uh, in relation to temperature, whether he's biraxic or not, or baroclusmal motor symptom, peripheral CNS abnormalities, such as absent reflexes, sensory sign, eye movements abnormalities. And also in MRI, there may be an indication that uh, this uh, may not fit with the cerebral palsy, uh, a lesion suggestive of progressive neurological disorder not keeping with the clinical sign. Most important is to have suspicious clinical mind uh, whenever you come across uh, a, a, a situation of a child with cerebral palsy, uh, clinical history and the suspicious mind is very, very important. We are living in, in a moving population, uh, uh, moving from one country to another. And quite often we come across uh, children uh, who are already come with a label moving to our services, uh, but we should not take it for granted that this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the label or the diagnosis. And especially in the first visit, we should take it as an opportunity to revisit, to have a fresh look at those children, revisit the history, the risk factors, uh, and evaluate the child uh, again. Summary and key messages. Well, and how we can improve the cerebral palsy, I think you have to develop your model of care in capturing children very early by getting frequent standardized surveillance, rapid referral uh, to diagnostic studies and specialized uh, centers. Uh, so you can make diagnosis early uh, on and identify the uh, emerging comorbidities and provide evidence-based treatment intervention and also participate in a research program that will improve your service as well. Uh, other areas uh, or important recommendation to ensure uh, we improve uh, the early detection of cerebral palsy that all babies admitted to NICU should have uh, uh, routine uh, GMA and uh, neurological assessment. Uh, specific strategy also uh, need to be developed to capture those uh, infants who have no, no risk, not known risk factors. Uh, important of serial examination uh, uh, and not to depend on single examination uh, to follow the persistence of recovery of abnormal sign. Uh, important to uh, identify barrier to clinician to feel confident to make early diagnosis and uh, also uh, automated technology uh, underway to help us in doing uh, mass surveillance for those uh, children uh, using uh, general movement uh, assessment. Uh, giving uh, parent early diagnosis and accurate uh, information will help achieve best outcome for those babies. Luckily, we are an area of uh, an era of coordinated uh, international effort aimed to reducing age of cerebral palsy diagnosis, which will certainly help to change the current situation. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, this is the international CBG guideline for early detection of cerebral palsy. If anyone interested, you can scan the code and read it at uh, your leisure. Thank you for listening. Uh,